All right. Good day, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the Garden Hour with MU Extension. Uh, glad you're able to join us today. Uh, it's it's bright and sunny in central Missouri where I'm at. Hopefully you've got to enjoy some of the the warmer weather over the past couple of weeks. I know everybody's either already in or itching to get out in the garden. Uh, so we're happy you're able to join us. And we have some timely topics and some questions uh, submitted from our audience via email that we're going to cover today. Uh, if you haven't connected with your local horticulture specialist and you have gardening questions or challenges this year, um, just know that we're here to help. And so we have folks uh, covering every county in the state. If you're in a county that's listed as open, that position is currently not filled, but you can reach out to your neighboring horticulture specialist. We're always happy to uh, help answer any questions. Pictures are always helpful. Um, if you're able to provide any pictures via email related to uh, the question that you have. If you haven't checked out our YouTube channel yet, uh, we do have all of the past archived garden hours. And we also select uh, snippets, kind of like a highlight reel um, that we have of the kind of most popular uh, segments of each garden hour. So like later today, we'll have something posted on the periodical cicadas, which was covered last week. So lots of good topics and uh, interesting information there. So I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to our moderator today, uh, Kelly McGowan. All right. Thank you, Justin. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we'll go ahead and get right into today's information. And we're going to start out with our meteorologist, uh, Zach Leeser. Um, he's going to give us a weather report. So, Zach. Great. And good afternoon, everyone. And, and welcome officially uh, to our spring season. Although here in Missouri, it feels like we've certainly had spring uh, for about a month now with, with some of the warm weather uh, we've been having. And, and that's one thing I wanted to take a look back at first today is our February 2024 summary, because it was really one for the record books here in Missouri. And so uh, here I've got the five kind of major sites across the state, and we can look at uh, what those temperatures and precipitation totals looked like for February here. And we can see temperatures well above average for uh, February. So anywhere from eight and a half degrees above normal in Cape Girardeau, all the way up to 10 and a half degrees above normal in Kansas City. Uh, but that's only at a, a few selected sites. If we look at the map on the right here, which shows uh, some of those departures from normal, really anywhere on the that, that shaded pink to red, is greater than about 10 degrees above average. And we see that really for uh, about the northern half of the state. So some remarkable uh, warm temperatures that we saw here in February. And so based on these temperatures, this was officially Missouri's warmest February on record. And so our average February temperature of 49.9 of degrees Fahrenheit was 12.1 degrees above average. And so this broke the previous record, which actually was set pretty recently uh, in February of 2017, but 2024 will now be our, our statewide warmest February that's on record. As kind of a fun fact, our, our average temperature in February of 45.9 degrees Fahrenheit was not only much higher than our, our typical February, February average, but it was also 2.3 degrees higher than our average March temperature. Uh, so climatologically, we kind of skipped a month and, and jumped right from January to March, it felt like, with our temperatures there. So uh, pretty remarkable that we could do that. Um, and then also now that winter's in the rear view mirror, uh, we can look back and, and see how that February impacted our overall winter temperatures. And remember, we were also quite warm in December as well. Uh, so we finished this winter, or December, January, February, six and a half degrees above normal across the state. And it was the state's second warmest winter, only to 1932, which is our warmest. And so even with that two weeks of extreme cold uh, that we saw in January, uh, our second warmest winter occurring in 2024. Even though the, the temperatures in February stole the headlines with just how warm we were, uh, it was also a very dry month and uncharacteristically dry uh, across the state. And so again, going to our sites here, 
Everywhere was really at least an inch above normal uh, with Columbia, St. Louis, close to two inches below normal for the month and, and Cape Girardeau, three inches below normal. And on the right here, if, if you look at the accumulated precipitation during February, uh, any of those yellows, that's less than a quarter inch of rainfall, uh, including here in Columbia, uh, a lot of the state was below an inch. And if you go up into to far northwest Missouri, there's a few spots uh, that really only received a few hundredths of an inch of rainfall in February. So uh, very dry to go along with those warm temperatures. And if we look at those precipitation totals compared to our percent of normals, pretty common to see less than 25% of our normal precipitation for February. Uh, so based on this, uh, we also saw that it was one of the driest Februarys on record for Missouri. Uh, so statewide, uh, it was our ninth driest February, but really in the northern half of the, the state that was even drier, we did see a few counties, uh, Saline, Randolph, and Scotland counties that did record their driest February on record. And so uh, to see a lot of locations like Kansas City, St. Louis, and Columbia have a top five warmest and a top five driest February uh, is pretty rare to see. Uh, overall, though, our, even though February was dry, we did have above normal precipitation in, in December and January. So finished pretty close to normal for, for winter as a whole for precipitation. But the big story from this winter to go along with our, our record warmth uh, was the lack of snowfall, it, it, except for uh, a few locations in, in the, along the Iowa border in northwest Missouri, almost the entire state finish, is going to finish the year uh, with, with below normal snowfall for our winter period. And so with all this warmth and, and dry conditions we saw in February, uh, we are concerned about drought conditions as we go into the spring here. Uh, really, over the winter in December, January, we were doing great with drought recovery and, and getting a lot of precipitation that was helping uh, with those drought conditions. But here I'll show on the left our, our drought map from January 30th compared to the most recent map on March 12th. And you can see we've added a lot more abnormally dry, moderate drought, and even some severe drought conditions across the state in response to some of this recent dryness. And so Something to be uh, aware of as we're getting uh, closer to, to getting into the growing season here that we do have uh, drought conditions across the state recently. And so as we've gotten into March, uh, we've, we've continued some of this pattern as, as we've continued to see warmer than normal temperatures, not record breaking warmth like we saw uh, in February, but still impressive. So seeing a lot of locations anywhere from six to nine degrees above normal so far in March, but our precipitation has actually been quite variable. So uh, we can see it, with the exception of Cape Girardeau, most of our sites here pretty close to normal. Um, but, but on the right, if you look at the map for the state for our, our percent of normal precipitation in March so far, you can see that it's pretty localized. You see some uh, pockets of green and blue, and, and this is really reflecting that we've seen a lot of thunderstorm activity that's bringing our rainfall so far this month. And so a map like this is, is maybe something we might see in the summertime where our precipitation is quite localized. And so uh, we have our halves that have gotten lucky and, and gotten under some of these thunderstorms and received a lot of precipitation, but some locations definitely have missed out. And in fact, uh, southern Missouri, really south of Springfield, east over to Poplar Bluff and into the Boot Heel have continued this, this dry spell from February into March. And so uh, really watching those areas in, in southern and southeastern Missouri for needing the most rainfall uh, right now. But looking ahead, uh, we certainly have pleasant conditions here in Columbia and, and across a lot of the state right now. And uh, this is really what we can expect for the rest of the week. So I'm showing our forecast high temperature map for today. And we're kind of got a battle with a, a cold air mass to our north and, and warm air to our south. And so a large swing in temperatures. So a high of 72 in Branson today. But if you're up in Kirksville, only 46 degrees. So a large gradient across the state. And we can expect that through about Saturday with mostly dry conditions and, and warmer temperatures in the 60s and 70s to the south, but cooler in the 40s and 50s to the north. Uh, especially the northern half of the state where we still expect several nights with low temperatures that are going to be 
right at or maybe below freezing. So uh, watch out for uh, frost and, and even some freeze conditions over the next few nights. Uh, we will have a few isolated rain chances over the next few days, but nothing to write home about, uh, just a few rain showers. What we'll really turn our attention to is, is getting into next week. Uh, it looks like rain chances are gonna quickly increase on Sunday ahead of a potent system that's gonna bring us a lot of rainfall late Sunday into early Tuesday. And so here's our forecast precipitation map, painting really a widespread one to two inches of rainfall across Missouri. And so this would be much needed rainfall for drought recovery, but the timing's also great as we're getting into the garden and starting to plant, it's good to have moisture uh, for those plants. And so uh, excited to see the, this rainfall on Monday, and we hope that this forecast verifies for that one to two inch of rainfall but another question is, when's uh, our last spring freeze maybe going to occur across Missouri? And so I want to show these maps from the Climate Prediction Center because after our big rain next week, it looks like there's a chance for some cold air following that system. So if we look at the 8 to 14 day temperature outlook here, leaning uh, a chance for below normal temperatures for the last week of March and into early April. And they've even highlighted parts of Missouri or all of Missouri and a slight risk for hazardous cool temperatures. And what that would mean for this time of year is a, a damaging freeze event. And so pretty low chance for this, only a 20%, um, but it's worth keeping an eye on the forecast to see how cold temperatures are gonna dip after our next rainmaker, because that could be a freeze event. And if that was our last freeze for the year, it'd be really right on line with what we expect. So most of the state typically sees the median date or the average date of that last spring hard freeze right in the first week of April. So after a very, very warm winter, we could end up with that last spring freeze being right on track for, for average. Um, and then I'll end here looking ahead for our, our seasonal outlook. It does look like the official forecast is backing off some of those warmer temperatures. So as we get into April and May, maybe close to normal uh, but some of the more active precipitation pattern we're starting to see in March here with, with more storms and, and precipitation activity is also forecast to continue here in April and May. So, so good news as we continue on uh, with the growing season. And with that, I'll end here for today. And if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take those. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Zach. Okay, uh, next we are going to talk about growing vegetables in containers. So let me get this pulled up and we will talk about this. Okay. Okay. All right, so it is time to start thinking about growing vegetables. I know around my house, I've been starting a lot of seedlings and I'm getting really excited to plant. And today we're gonna to talk a little bit about um, some, some alternatives of growing in the soil. So let's get into this. Well, maybe we'll get into it if I can get my computer to work. There we go. Okay, so if you are new to vegetable gardening, um, I encourage you to consider growing in containers or at least start out very, very small if you've never gardened before. Um, you know, often I'll see pictures like this on the internet, and while this is a beautiful garden, who wouldn't love to spend time in this garden? For those of us that have been gardening for many years, we know that this is a ton of work. It's almost daily work, a lot of weeding, a lot of watering, and just not really practical for people who have a really busy lifestyle. And so whenever someone comes to me and says, you know, I want to start a vegetable garden, I really like the look look of something like this, you know, I just, I try to encourage them, just keep it small, keep it realistic, and then as you learn, you can expand, but, but um, a good place to start is growing in containers, and there's a lot of benefits of growing in containers. Um, you do have improved drainage. Now, I will say that um, it is important to use proper soil in your containers. Um, if you've ever noticed, if you buy just a bag of regular old topsoil, it can be pretty 
pretty clumpy. It just doesn't drain really well. And when we're, when we're growing in containers, we really want to make sure that we're getting a well-drained potting mix. It's very loose. It's not clumpy um, because we want those containers to, to drain well and not hold water. Now, with that being said, um, we do want them to drain well, but you will have to monitor them and make sure that they're not drying out. So they really need to be uh, monitored every day and just make sure that they're not, you know, drying out in the sun. Um, ease of maintaining. This is a wonderful benefit of container gardening. Just having a few containers with vegetables in it, they're easier to maintain, they're easier to weed, they're easier to water, they're easier to harvest, they're easier to keep an eye on, and it's just much more um, easy than taking care of a large in-ground vegetable garden. And I mentioned a little bit about soil. Um, the, the benefit of growing in containers or raised beds or anything other than the ground is you can add in your own soil mix. And again, when, when we're growing in containers, we want to make sure that it's something that's well-drained and not um, hard and clumpy. That's going to be the main thing we want to keep in mind. And because of that really good soil, it's going to allow those vegetables to really develop a deeper root system, which is going to make them more drought tolerant and just make the plant healthier overall. Another benefit of growing in containers is that the soil warms up faster in the spring. You know, the soil is above ground level, so it has uh, better access to warm daytime temperatures. It helps that soil to warm up quicker, and therefore it helps seeds to germinate quicker or transplants to grow quicker, quicker as well. And one really good thing about growing in containers is there's a lot of smaller miniature plant varieties that are on the market right now. You know, I often hear from people when we talk about growing vegetables in containers, they're like, well, you know, I've seen how big a cucumber plant can get or a zucchini plant can get, and I just don't know if I can grow that in containers. Well, um, the plant industry has listened and we now have several different types of miniature varieties of our favorite garden vegetables. Um, we see here a little cucumber. This one's called quick snack cucumber. And um, the one here on the right is called orange hat tomato. These are a couple of uh, miniature varieties that I have been working with recently. I've been pretty, um, pretty happy with the way that they've produced, especially these orange hat tomatoes. Um, I'll show you this photo here. So myself and some of my colleagues were working on some hydroponic um, different hydroponic classes. We have hydroponics set up at our homes. We're learning how to use them so we can teach classes on it. And the orange hat tomatoes has been one of our favorites. And you can see here how vigorous this plant grows, how good, how many tomatoes are on it. And of course, this is growing hydroponically, but they also do well in just a pot of soil as, as well. So um, a lot of great miniature varieties. So I encourage you to look for some of those if you do want to grow in containers. So what type of container should you use? Well, you want to make sure um, the, the larger the better. You know, when we get in the hot, dry part of the summer, and I'm sure you've all experienced this before, if you have really small containers sitting outside in the direct sun, they're going to dry out incredibly quickly. So when it comes to containers, we want to make sure that um, there's a lot of soil mass in there so that it, you know, doesn't dry out so quickly. So the larger, the better. And you can really use about anything. We see in this photo here, They've used everything from just nursery pots to trash cans, and really you can use about anything to grow vegetables. Um, we've talked about the potting mix, just make sure that it's well draining. And then also you want to think about the weight of your containers. Another great thing about growing vegetables in containers is that you can move them around. So for instance, if you have some containers set up on your deck and you're trying to grow vegetables in those, and then you notice that, oh, they're getting shaded for most of the day. I need to move those somewhere else. Well, if they're really, really heavy, like if you have one of these trash cans, 
hands, those can be very heavy and hard to move around. So when you are potting up your containers, uh, consider adding some soilless growing media in with your regular soil. That's things like peat moss, vermiculite, perlite. Uh, those things will help to keep the containers lighter and also help with drainage. And then again, watering is very important. These will need to be water or monitored daily. So something that I was looking at over the weekend that I thought was kind of interesting is just using a big cardboard box as kind of a planting bed. And the example that I was uh, reading about is they were planting potatoes in just a large cardboard box. They basically just filled it in with soil, planted their potatoes, and I just thought that that was a really fascinating idea. Um, I've always liked to use cardboard in my vegetable garden as a weed suppressant, so this is just another you know thing that you can do to recycle cardboard and use it in your garden now certainly the cardboard will break down throughout the season this is meant to be a one season planter um, but again it's just kind of an interesting way to to grow and then the photo here on the right is grow bags and if you're not familiar with grow bags i think they're pretty interesting um i recently moved and i had potted up a bunch of things in these grow bags and they did very well for several months um actually they're still in grow bags and still doing well but basically these grow bags are made out of a material that's like a very heavy kind of felt material. It allows the root system to breathe. Uh, they come in many different sizes. They hold up very well. They can be used for several different growing seasons. And you could grow vegetables in there all season long as, as well. So um, just some options to think about. Okay, and then, you know, as far as growing vegetables in containers, you know, we usually think about the summer and some of our summer vegetables, but also consider growing things in spring and fall. You know, having a container of lettuce on your deck or back porch is going to be a great, you know, option when you're preparing dinner. Um, and there's a lot of things that we can grow in spring and fall, and I've got a list of those here. Um, so, you know, don't just grow in summer. Try growing some of these other things in in cooler weather as well. I also want to mention vertical gardening. A lot of times when we grow in containers, it's because we don't have a lot of space or we don't want to have a huge garden. And I just want to remind you that a lot of vegetables can grow vertically. Uh, cucumbers, we can see some cucumbers growing here on some type of a trellising system that could easily easily be included with a container. And then the photo here on the right is, uh, it looks like cherry tomatoes growing in a container. And then those can be kind of staked to a deck railing or whatever as they continue to grow. Uh, pole beans, green beans are one of my favorites for growing vertically. They're good producers. They produce all summer long and um, just a great option for, for growing vertically. So just consider this when you are setting up your container vegetable garden. So a little bit about water. Um, you want to make sure that you're watering when you're getting the most bang for your buck. So typically that's going to be mornings, uh, 6 to 8 a.m. in the summer. And what's going to happen when you water in the morning is that the leaves of the plants that you watered are going to dry out quickly in the sun. And you may remember from other uh, garden hour segments that we've done that wet leaves equal plant diseases. It increases the risk of plant diseases. But when you water in the morning, that's going to allow them to dry out quickly and uh, reduce that risk of disease, as opposed to watering at night when the plants are going to be wet all night long. Um, so, so do keep that in mind. And then, you know, as far as watering during the hot part of the day, it's going to cause a lot of evaporation and you're going to lose a lot of your water um, that way as well. So morning is best if possible. Now, if you're going on vacation, um, you can set up all kinds of drip irrigation setups like we see here. And there's a million different ways that you can do this. These are just a couple of examples. Um, if you need to water these while you're going to be away for a few days, and this can be set up on a timer as well. 
Um, along with this question, there was also a question about blueberries, where to purchase them, that sort of thing. And I do want to mention that blueberries, there are container varieties of blueberries that I have heard uh, good things about. People that I know that have grown them have had good yields and have been pleased with those. So that is another consideration. You can grow, you know, flowers and fruit in, in containers as well. And then, you know, blueberries can be purchased at most. Uh, garden supply centers and if you're looking for some really good cultivars of blueberries that do well in Missouri check out our extension website and uh, look up some of our growing information for blueberries and those will be listed okay I think that's all I had so with that I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jennifer and Jennifer is going to talk about calorie pears and she's also going to talk about weeds and pre-emergence. All right, thank you Kelly. So by now many of you probably have heard about the pear buyback program. This is going to take place on April 23rd. And why have a pear buyback program? Well, if you drive down any major highway in Missouri, you're going to see Bradford pears all up and down the road where they have escaped cultivation. And these are some photos that I borrowed from the Missouri Department of Conservation. And you can see how the Bradford pear uh, has escaped and is taken over uh, roadsides. I was over in the Kansas City area near Excelsior Springs about two weeks ago, and I found just a like a grove of Bradford pear trees, and they were just starting to bloom at that time. So they are everywhere in the state. You can go up and down Highway 63, I-35, I-44, just all over the state, and you're going to find the Bradford pears along the roadsides. So this has become a major problem. So the Missouri Invasive Plant Council, in partnership with Forest Relief of Missouri, Forest Keeling Nursery and the Missouri Department of Conservation, they have uh, partnered and they are going to have a buyback program where homeowners can cut down their Bradford pear trees. You need to take a photo of that tree and then you can send it in and receive a free tree. So I thought I would go into a little more detail about how to do that. So this is going to take place on April 23rd. And these partners are all inviting everyone to cut down any Bradford pear that you have, may have in your, in your yard. Uh, you can go to the MissouriInvasives.org website. And on that website, click on the link that says 2024 Calorie Bradford Pear Buyback. And when you click on that, a form will pop up. And then you can fill out the form with your name, your address, and you can select a location. And you need to select the location nearest to you. And these are the ones to choose from. If you don't live in any of these locations, you will have to go to one of these, uh, the one that is nearest you. So choose your location. And then after you choose a location, a list of plants will come up. And I chose these three locations to show you what is being offered. So you can see if you live in the Columbia area, you have a lot more choices. So they're saying that these trees will do well in the Columbia area. Now, if you look at Kirksville, we only have four choices and that's where I'm from. And that is probably because we're up here in what we consider the ice box of Missouri where not everything is going to do well and it's not hardy. So we have less to choose from. Um, here you see Cape Girardeau. Uh, and there's quite a list here, but notice that some of these are already sold out. So they started uh, taking registrations on March 15th. So March 15th to April 15th is the time where you can register, but notice that some of these are already sold out. So it is best to sign up as soon as you can. So don't put this off any longer. If you plan to cut down a Bradford pear, uh, go ahead and get this form filled out and get your tree selected because some of these locations are selling out of trees. And that's all I have for the pair buyback program. All right, and now I'm going to talk about weeds. 
So we had a question that came in and the question was, you know, how do I get rid of, or how do, how do I control weeds that are already up and growing? You know, what do I do? So I think first we ought to talk about what are some of these weeds that are up and growing right now. And one of them is chickweed. And this is a weed that will start germinating maybe in the boot hill in southern Missouri in maybe in January, late January. Here in the Kirksville area, this weed will start germinating in mid-February or late February most years. This year it's been mid, it was mid-February, February when I started seeing it. And this weed will grow quickly. It likes cold weather. It is a winter annual and it puts on a white flower. And you want to get this weed under control before it starts flowering and setting seed. Because once it starts setting seed, it's gonna drop those seed and then you'll have the same problem next year. Another common weed that we see right now, another winter annual, is henbit. When you're driving down the road, you may see a field of purple and say, oh, that field is really pretty, but it's a field of weeds, it's a field of uh, henbit. And that is a plant in the mint family. <clears throat> You can see here in the lower left uh, corner of the screen that I have, there's a, the hen bit photo and the a dead nettle. So dead nettle is kind of a look alike, but it's a little different. So we'll move on to that. Hen bit has more uh, droopy leaves as you can see here, but both of these uh, plants are winter annuals. Uh, they're in the mint family and they are look alikes. Now, what do I do to get rid of these plants? So once they're up and growing, you really have just a couple of options. You need to hand pull them or hoe them out, or you can use a herbicide. You can spot spray, which that's what I do when I have henbit and chickweed or dead nettle that's already up in my flower beds or garden. I spot spray and I use Roundup. Roundup is non-selective, meaning it will kill anything it touches. Or you can use a broadleaf herbicide containing 2,4-D, which kills broadleaf plants. So that's about all you can do if your weeds are already up and growing. And chickweed, probably statewide, is emerged and growing in our gardens now. So at this point, we're most likely going to have to just use a herbicide, either Roundup or a broadleaf herbicide containing 2,4-D. But be very careful. Uh, read the directions. Uh, put on protective uh, clothing or gloves when you go out to spray and do not spray on a windy day. For winter annuals, uh, for these plants I just mentioned, if you're wanting to get control early on, you can use preen. Uh, preen is a pre-emergent herbicide, and I have found that putting it on in the fall gets me the best control. Waiting till you see the first chickweed or henbit to emerge is probably too late. So I have gotten the best control when I apply it in October or November. And then it has that time to work into the soil and kill those uh, weed seeds. So also keep in mind that preen only kills weed seed. It's not going to kill your existing emerged weeds, okay? So it's only going to kill weed seed. So I put it on in late fall, and then I get good control of the, those weeds. It, it kills the weed uh, seed, it kills the seed, and prevents it from germinating. Now, as we go into late spring and into early summer, we will start having weeds such as crabgrass and foxtail and barnyard grass and all those grassy weeds that will start coming up in our, our iris beds or strawberry beds or whatever, you know, whatever bed you have with a lot of weeds. So what you can do is after you are done harvesting your asparagus and done harvesting your strawberries, you can put, <clears throat> excuse me, you can put preen um, in your bed. You can use the regular um, preen uh, with trifluralin in it. Um, and you can get good control of those grassy weeds. So that is what I will do uh, for control of foxtail is I'll put um, put preen in those areas where I've had it in the past. Now, if you're going to use preen in a vegetable garden where you have existing vegetables or you're going to plant vegetable seed, um, you, you don't you don't want to even use preen if you're going to plant seed. But if you have existing plants, uh, you're all, you know your vegetables are already up. You want to use uh, organic preen or this the natural preen, which you see in the lower left. So that is 100% corn gluten meal. It is safe to put around vegetable plants or things that are edible. And that is what we recommend. The other preen uh, is for flower gardens and areas where you're not going to have edible plants. But again, I guess the, the take home message here is start early with the preen. 
uh, in late fall for the winter annuals. And then for the grassy weeds, you probably want to start maybe in April or May. Uh, you might need to do it uh, twice during the growing season to get good control. And it will kill seed, not, not the existing plants. And for more information, you know, if you guys have questions about applying any of these products, uh, reach out to uh, one of us, uh, you know, in your region and one of us horticulture specialists, and we will be glad to uh, give you more information. Kelly, back to you. All right. Good information. Thank you, Jennifer. Okay, next we're going to hear from Ramon, and he is going to talk about fairy gardens. Okay, Kelly. Let me let me connect this. Uh, Can you see that? Yes. All right. Well, to be honest, uh, this is my first time that I read and find and search about a uh, fairy gardens. I don't have much idea uh, experience with them, but for what I could gather. It is a miniature garden, very small miniature plants and tiny accessories designed to lure fairies. Uh, that's, a, that's a pretty mystic, pretty interesting right there. Uh, it can be indoors and outdoors in containers or, or, uh, or directly planted in, in the ground. Uh, Usually the, the, the accessories that you, you can buy them or you can get them around your house. Sometimes you have things that you don't know where to put them and you can go into the garden uh, to how you design it is actually depend on you. It's pretty personal. I had there um, uh, um, a link to one of the, to the uh, website where I got these pictures. So I have to get credit for some of the pictures that I'm gonna show. Uh, but you can go to the internet and find out there is plenty of information about a uh, fairy gardens. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as I mentioned, it can be indoors and outdoors. Uh, it came from the Celtic with some that the fairies are worth attracting because if you're nice to them, they bring good luck, health, and prosperity. And we all want that, right? So yeah, we have to be nice to the fairies and attract them and treat them well. So if when you design a fairy garden, you have to be think uh, thoughtful about what would the fairies like, and it has to be a welcoming, peaceful setting with a tiny house and space for them to play. Uh, that's uh, interesting too. So the creation of a fairy garden is only limited by your imagination. Uh, and that's what is personalized because it's what you feel it would be comfortable or attractive to these fairies that are gonna bring you some uh, assist, some help to you. Yeah, it's very interesting though. Uh, now you can create there are many things. Actually, as I, as I said, there is no limitation. So you can uh, themes the themes can be anything: forest, prairie, uh, desert. Uh, beach, mountains, etc. It's all what you like. If you want to bring a different environment or a different setting that where you have in your garden or in your area, it might be nice. How about having a desert or having like, actually this picture, I took it from my area here in Missouri, uh, a house that, I, that was actually for sale and I took it. So took advantage of that. Um, but uh, I mean, if you're in the forest area, you can have a forest uh, theme, but you might want to maybe have a prairie or a beach theme uh, to change a little bit the scenario. Uh, so it's, it's also about your how you feel about it and you think the fairies are going to like it. Have fun by scavenging materials that you may have. I mean, there is a lot of uh, stores that can sell you a lot of stuff, very nice stuff, or even miniature gardens already, kits ready to go. But if you, you want to use what you have at home, you can you can uh, do a lot with them. You can see in this picture, for example, there's a lot of rocks, locally scavenged uh, rocks. Uh, there are a few figurines that might be gnomes, but are other ones that are not. Uh, some suggestion says to use tiles as, a, as a, a walking path or something like that. You see gravel there. So you don't have to buy a lot of things. You can uh, find things around your house or close by in your area. 
Mm -hmm. uh, now the main thing is when you use miniature plants, live plants, you have to look for dwarf or miniature plants. And even though if you find varieties that are dwarf or miniature, you still have to maintain them. So you probably require to watering once in a while, fertilize them once in a while and prune them or snip them to keep them small or the shape you want to. Uh, you can set up everything like you see in this picture under the, the, the balcony, the terrace there, or you can put it in a, in a forest area or under a tree, under a shrub. It, it, it depends what area you want to dedicate to this uh, garden, to this uh, miniature garden or fairy gardens. Uh, a few examples of uh, miniature plants there, you can use moths, you can see them in the in this picture. Uh, ivies, uh, boxwoods, dwarf boxwoods, always think in dwarf plants or miniature plants. And you can think uh, like a, a bonsai, if you have experience with bonsai, it's kind of the same. Bonsais require a lot of pruning and, and, uh, and um, twisting to give the shape you want. Uh, you may not want to twist them, but you will need to snip them and prune them quite a bit to keep them small. Uh, according to the size of your design and the the, the fairy that you you wanna or the accessories that you wanna put in the in the garden and you see there there is a church there are houses etc. So that's the main thing. Uh, maintaining the plan is important. About the design is all up to you. Mm -hmm. And how to plant the uh, the plants? I mean, it's it's a general idea as we always uh, mentioned and just. Uh, um, Kelly mentioned about how to grow a garden uh, and uh, a back door, um, a garden in, at home. Is the, the materials um, or the or the soil that you can use the same type of soil or or uh, buy soilless media. Uh, everything that you do in your garden it will work with the miniature gardens. Just you have to maintain it to keep it small. And with that, I appreciate that uh, there you some some gnomes and and, and fairies who are playing in the garden, but. With that is, I would suggest you to search the internet. There's plenty of information and stores that, that can get you something. But if you have a budget, you can find a lot of stuff around your house. Any questions? I don't see any questions. So thank you very much, Ramon. All right. Yeah, and I was also going to mention the uh, fairy gardens are very popular right now, and they've got a, a lot of little decorations that you can put in a fairy garden at Dollar Tree. So uh, very budget friendly if you want to if you want to check that out. So, OK, well, next we are going to talk about growing onions. It is that time and Justin is going to give us some pointers. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Um, yeah, onions can be a fun and productive crop to grow. Um, some folks might not be as familiar with growing onions as they might be with things like tomatoes or lettuce, um, but they can be a great crop uh, in the home vegetable garden. So onions are generally planted as sets, which is the top image here. So it looks like a little bulb with some little leaves sprouting out of the top or they can be planted as plants. And we're right in that sweet spot of that planting window when it would be a good time to plant uh, plant onions. And so these can be ordered um, from some garden catalogs, but you can often find these uh, at your local co-op or garden center uh, in a small bag or bundle. There is a sweet spot for onions in terms of pH. They like, like to be in a nice neutral range between 6.2 and 6.8. Um, you want to plant them about one to two inches deep or two to three inches apart for larger bulbs. And they, they do like phosphorus and potassium a little bit more than nitrogen. So a 510-10 could be a good fertilizer option for, for onions. It's good to add some kind of mulch um, after establishment. Onions are fairly shallow rooted, so... Weeding and cultivation with tools, it's pretty easy to damage those roots. So mulch can be a, a good way to keep those weeds down and keep those roots protected. And you can see at the bottom in this image um, are both onion sets and onion plants. 
so in terms of the varieties of onions that are best to grow in Missouri, um, long day varieties perform best and they're called long day because they need 15 hours of sunlight for bulb formation. Uh, these are kind of broken down into long day. You might also see intermediate day or short day varieties and that's all based on the uh, hours of sunlight for bulb formation. So you'll want to remove the flowering heads um, as they as they come up and these are a long season crop so you're going to be kind of in it for the long haul once you plant your onions. These are some of the varieties that are recommended for Missouri. This is from our MU vegetable planting calendar um, but you have some different options in terms of flavor, uh, red onions, yellow onions, white onions, but there, there are definitely some varieties that perform well in Missouri. These are uh, long day varieties or intermediate day varieties, and it's a little confusing. Sometimes you're looking up these in a seed catalog and they might say long day, but then in another catalog they say intermediate day, but I would stick to the long day or intermediate day um, varieties for our uh, Missouri climate and growing season. So this is a snip. If you've never seen our MU extension vegetable planting calendar, it's a very handy tool uh, with a lot of information in just a couple pages, but every vegetable plant, um, it will list varieties that do well in Missouri and planting dates by region. So if you look at these uh, planting dates, now would, would be a good time to plant onions in uh, most parts of the state. Northern Missouri, it's still a little bit early, uh, but you can see from this map here, it's broken down in a northern planting region, central planting region, and southern planting region. And you can see the Ozark Plateau is actually paired up with the northern part of Missouri uh, due to the higher elevation and a little bit uh, lower temperatures and later spring frost. So this is from a question we had a couple years ago, should onions grow above ground? So first you're gonna see that vegetative growth um, pop through and then the bulbs will begin sizing up and swelling. So the onion itself will form at or near the soil surface. Um, and unlike potatoes, damn it, uh, exposure to the sun will not affect them. So if you have potatoes and they grow slightly above ground or exposed, they will get green and that can become toxic. So unlike potatoes, you don't need to hill onions and you'll get uh, best maturity if you just leave them like they are as they grow out of the soil. So when to harvest, um, this image on the right shows that onion neck as it begins to fall over and that's a good time to go ahead and get them out of the soil. Um, after you dig them up, you can put them in a warm location with good air circulation. This will kind of help the curing process so they last longer in storage. After a couple of weeks, you'll want to go ahead and top those onions when those necks are well dried. You'll want to store them in a cool, dry place. And if you do have any that are damaged, go ahead and segregate those from the ones that are in good shape um, because any kind of uh, post-harvest rot will be spread from those damaged ones to the good onions. So that is all I have on onions. All right. Thank you, Justin. And then to go along with that, it's also time to plant potatoes. And Ruba is going to talk to us about that. Uh, can you see my screen? I think the display is. Uh, Kelly, can, thank you, we, Kelly. We yeah. can see it. There you go. Now we can see it. All right. Thank you. So, uh, as uh, 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 as Kelly mentioned that the so the potato planting time is approaching here in Missouri. So I am going to talk briefly about some basics about put it. Uh, about the potato planting. So the potato is uh, uh, one of the most important vegetables crops grown in Missouri, and uh, it is native to the uh, Indian region of South America. And its botanical name is Solanum tuberosum, and is a member of Solanaceae family or the nightshade family. 
uh, other vegetable crops in this family are tomato, eggplant, and peppers. So uh, for this crop, uh, we should consider for practicing crop rotation to avoid uh, disease and insect pest issues when we plan to plant uh, plant potato in our garden. So if it is possible, uh, rotating potato uh, every three to four years, uh, four to five years is the best option to minimize disease and, uh, uh, and the insect pest. Uh, this is an example of crop rotation uh, we, can, we can practice in our garden. So if we plan to, pl so to plant potato. So in the first year, uh, we can plant cucurbits such as pumpkin, squash, or cucumber, something like that. And in the second year, uh, we can plant some other some other vegetable crops such as cabbage, broccoli, onion, or garlic. And in the third year, uh, we can plant like green beans, peas, broad beans, and other legume vegetables. And in the fourth year, we can plant potatoes. So the benefit of planting legume vegetables in the rotation is they will fetch those free uh, uh, free nitrogen from the air and they add to the soil and, and that is going to be utilized by our uh, next season crop. Right. Okay, so let's talk about planting. So. Uh, there is an idea about planting potato on St. Patrick's Day. So it may be a good advice for other parts of the country, but it may not be for all parts of Missouri. So we advise to plan according to the local weather conditions, not by the calendar day. So it is advised to plant potato when soil temperature is above 45 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, if we plant, uh, if we plant early, the crop may be damaged by late spring freeze, and the uh, and the seed piece may decay due to wet and poor soil. So in central Missouri, the soil temperature may be above 45 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, mostly like after March 20th, and it may be a, 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 a good plan to plant. Uh, to plant potato in between March 20 and April 1. But uh, again, check your soil temperature before planting. So for the soil, for uh, uh, for the good growth of uh, uh, good growth of potato, so the potato grows well on deep soil, friable and well-drained loam soil with good fertility and good content of organic matter. So for good yield of potato, so uh, it needs a good, uh, good amount of fertilizers. Uh, so we should test our soil for what nutrients uh, we need to add and how much we need to apply to our soil. Uh, so uh, for the potato, uh, the ideal soil pH is, uh, is quite low. Uh, it is uh, uh, the optimum soil pH is uh, 5.3 to 6. Uh, if the pH is high, so there will be a uh, scab disease problem in potato. And the potato requires a sunny location in the garden. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the land preparation before planting potato. So for land preparation, uh, we should till the ground about uh, eight to 12 inches deep and allow for drying soil uh, for a week or two. Then uh, we should uh, we should harrow and label the soil and make furrow for planting. Uh, so let's talk about fertilizers. So for good yield, potato need good amount of fertilizer. So I already mentioned that. Uh, it is recommended to apply a mixed fertilizer uh, that contains higher ratio of phosphorus and potassium uh, than the nitrogen. For example, uh, uh, 5, 10, 10. Uh, uh, so although we uh, we recommend to apply fertilizer based on the soil test result, but if we have not tested our soil, it is advised to apply about 2 to 3 pounds of this fertilizer for, uh, uh, for about 100 square feet. Uh, we apply fertilizer at the time of planting by band placement method for potato. 
So uh, we put that fertilizer about six inches deep and about two to three inches on either side of the area where we plant seed. And we also do a side dressing of fertilizer uh, uh, once or twice uh, uh, when the tubers begin to form uh, at the rate of about one pound of fertilizer for like about 25 feet of row to increase the tuber yield. So let's look on the variety of potato uh, we can grow here in Missouri. So Irish potatoes are grown in Missouri as a spring crop. And uh, one of them is the uh, Irish cobbler. So uh, it is the best as uh, 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 as uh, early varieties for, uh, for Missouri. Uh, it is a good quality potato. It matures early and it produces a good ale. Another, uh, Another potato variety is uh, Bliss Triumph. So uh, this is an extra uh, early variety that matures about a week to 10 days ahead uh, than, than, the, than the iris cobbler. So let's look on the planting distance and depth. So potatoes are planted in row, varying from 30 to 42 inches apart. And seed to seed spacing is about uh, eight to 16 inches in the row. So potato tuber formation takes place about four inches under the soil surface. So we plant the tuber uh, about three to three and a half inches deep. So uh, a, 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 a reef is made after planting. So seeds are covered uh, with about six inches of the soil. So uh, let me talk about the cultivation. So the main objective of potato cultivation is to control weed and to loosen the soil. So it should be as shallow as possible when we cultivate the soil uh, in the in the potato field because the roots of potato they are near the soil surface. Uh, and uh, uh, as I already mentioned, uh, Another objective of cultivation is to loosen the soil, which becomes compacted from planting operation and from the spring rain. So based on the weed infestation, we need to cultivate potato about two to three times in between the row to remove weeds. So uh, during the final cultivation, uh, we need to throw the soil toward the row to form a broad breeze, uh, as like in this picture. So the reef helps to prevent sunburn, so to have better drainage, and uh, it is uh, easy to dig potato. So that's all I have. Kelly, back to you. All right, thank you. Okay, well, that is the end of our time together. So I am gonna turn it back over to Justin to close us out. All right, thanks, Kelly. Um, so we are back to our spring, our, our normal growing season schedule on April 3rd, we will resume the weekly versions of the Garden Hour um, from noon to one. And we do encourage folks to go ahead and submit questions to the Garden Hour so we can answer your questions uh, live. And pictures are always helpful. So when you go ahead um, and submit your questions, there's an option to attach pictures. And that's always helpful for us to figure out what's going on and also to kind of share those pictures uh, during the garden hour. Once again, if you need help horticulturally in your garden or your landscape, feel free to reach out to your local MU Extension Horticulture Specialist. We're always happy to help you out, uh, happy to give you research-backed information to help your gardens thrive. There was always a lot of good information in the chat. So if you wanna save the chat, you can hover over um, the three dots down at the bottom and it will allow you to save that file if you wanna come back to any of the links in there um, or, or other further resources. And that is all I have and thanks for joining us and we'll look forward to seeing you on April 3rd.